Welcome to Absolute Comics, right here at the Comic Story and Podcast Network, twitch.tv slash comic story, aired every Tuesday at about 6 p... No, wait, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then uploaded to our Patreons, middle of the week, and then at the following week, uploaded over to YouTube, giving you two methods to support us and get it early, or just wait until it hits YouTube. It's whatever works for you. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Benny, known as the Comic Storian. I run that entire Comic Storian channel and make arrangements. Sal over here is from Comic Pop. He runs all of their stuff and makes all of their arrangements. Um, and yeah, you're all bray bray. Uh, that's it. That's, that's, that's the intro. Did I do the intro right? I think you nailed it. All right, so guys, we're going to give you guys a heads up. We have we have an interview with Sean Gordon Murphy about his Indiegogo, if you don't know who he is. He is the guy who uh, created the Curse of the White Knight universe, and he wants to talk about a private project that he has. So this episode is going to be a little bit shorter to make room to put that on the back end. It may also become a solo episode on Comic Storian, so I don't know what's going to happen with it, but we're making room for it here in Absolute Comics. What does that mean for you, our Absolute Comics viewers? Well, that means that Sal and I are going to have to take off a little bit early today, but on a larger note, it means that uh, we're going to go really quickly through our topics today, really really quickly through our topics. What do you, what do you think, Sal? You think, think that's pretty accurate? I think we can nail it. Yeah, let's do it. I, it's almost like a challenge, like a challenge. I'm, right now, I'm stalling while I look for the list. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> yeah. All right, here we go, and uh, let's, you know what, let's just kick it off, ready, Sal? I'm going to shotgun you the topics, and I want to get your opinions. The first one, I know you got a lot to say about. I know you spent a ton of time reading it. I'm setting this (laughs) up for you to fail, and you know it. Let's Uh talk about death metal. (laughs) Death metal. Yeah, I was, I'm about three pages into death metal, so I'm, look, I'm, I'm, I feel very qualified to talk expertly about what happened. Um. No, it's, you know, here it is, and it's okay. it's the, yeah. Whoa. Well, I, I have a question. I'm going to make a video about this and my opinions on it. It's going to go up on the main channel, but okay. I wanted to get your opinions on this. Why not? Uh, I, before, I need to preface this with this. I love DC Metal. I love the Justice League run. I love Death Metal. I love them all. But my question is, are you just kind of ready for just, like, normal Justice League and Batman stories now? Yeah, I've been ready since Snyder started. <laughs> <laughs> like, on Justice League, like, his Justice League run, you know, started out strong, and then it just it just kept going off the rails to... And it See, clearly was going in this direction. I, I was ready for us to get back to basics when we got back to basics the first time. So this... this and knowing how much, because if you haven't seen the the whiteboard that Snyder put together of like how much metal is coming, um, I don't, I'm just I'm almost ready to just say I'm not reading it until it's done. Like I'm just gonna wait because it, um, it doesn't need my help. I mean, I want to specify. I love what he's doing. I love the insanity, but. One, his little side stories that he was doing, like that felt like the animated Justice League. I loved it. And yes. I'm not going to lie, I really enjoyed the Eradicator storyline and the uh, Amazonian one that's going on right now in regular Justice League. Yes. Which yes. Makes, the one that takes place before all of this? Yeah. Right. So, you know, now going into Death Metal this morning and reading through that and going, wow, this is really over the top and crazy. Another part of me was kind of like, I. Could, this has been going on for like three years now, Scott. Yeah, like, <laughs> it, 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 that's the thing is that it's been over the top and crazy for like four years. Yeah, and and, Can I, and we I get love a break, it, but I'm ready for it to go back to normal. Because yeah, like we didn't have normal Batman during this. He was dealing with the Tom King run the whole time. Right, right. You know, and <laughs> Superman wasn't normal Superman. We were dealing with Bendis getting rid of John Kent. So like, yep. when was the last time we had normal DC universe? Like, honestly, I think it was New Fifty Two. Where everyone yeah. was just doing their own things, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it was just normal comic book adventures. More or less, yeah. I mean, in during Rebirth, we had a couple of things, but they were also cleaning house. Like we had the merging of Superman. Uh, you know, we had, we had Batman was pretty standard. Uh, but again, like when Tom King came on, it was kind of like, well, we're upsetting the apple cart there. Yeah, the thing about metal is, I think. That it's exactly what retailers need. You know, retailers are probably like, "This is amazing! We get oh, to yeah. make midnight releases. We can we can have metal posters. You know, people are coming in to buy it. Obviously, it's got the yeah, it's got kind of a '90s collectors like vibe to it with the chrome chromium cover. So it's like, this is exactly what retailers are, are looking for because 100 percent agree with you on that. There are, there are no competing events. Empire's on its way, but it's not here yet. Right now, everyone can just focus on metal and be excited and come buy books. 
So that that's fantastic. But I think that there are, and I think we're not alone, that there is a subset of comic book fandom that's like, yeah, I did have like two and a half months off, essentially, from the comic book industry, but I'm still feeling the effects of the Snyder run. Yeah. And I'm still kind of just aching for it to get back to normal. So maybe... Maybe the maybe the ending actually will feel more exciting when it's over because it'll be like we're finally back to normal. Like we're right, a, and like it'll be such a relief. Like from I said, this. I I am I do like what he's doing. I don't want people to think that I'm complaining. Like I don't want metal. I want metal. But right. I, it's almost like the argument I had back in the day when they were when Marvel was changing up every single superhero, and I was like, oh, yeah. can we just have a normal book on the side? Just <laughs> Iron Man just fighting things. You know, it's Tony Stark. Like I almost feel like Metal, like the Justice League book's been great because it. Like I was reading through Metal, and I'm like, what happened in the Justice League? All oh, right, just a nice Justice League story. You know? Yes, yes. I mean, like maybe that's what we needed over at Black Label. Just like, how about a story where the Justice League fight? A, guy, a, a bad guy, you know, <laughs> or save the mascara from invaders, you know, yeah. something that's like a standard Justice League story that isn't the universe is upside down on fire and everyone's like playing guitar. Like, whoa. <laughs> okay, so, um, which then leads us to the next topic on our list here. Because sadly, you can't talk directly about death metal that much because you haven't read it. So No, I haven't really. I, which I, I, actually, I want to throw that in there. How do you feel about this Tuesday thing? Because I constantly forget this is a thing now. I do. We could, we'll could. We'll get used to it. The question is whether the retailers are doing it. Because that's my question. Like, I don't know if retailers, because I know a lot of retailers had a, some strong reaction to DC's entire initiative. So my question is, are retailers unpackaging their books and putting them out on Tuesdays? Or are they just going, no, they're in boxes. They'll be out on Wednesday. Like, I, I can I, tell you right now, some are probably lazy enough for that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I wanted to hit my comic book retailer today, but I was crazy busy today. I never got out of the house. So I've just been... So I, I don't know. But I would assume if I were a savvy retailer that Death Metal would be on the shelf. Like, that I'd be yeah. selling it today. Oh, yeah. But, definitely. yeah, I, I'll, I'll get used to it. Because I think, between you, me, and the lamppost, I think that DC's going to make a deal with Diamond in the next three months, and we'll be back to Wednesdays. I, mm, I was talking about that for a moment. Uh, okay. Even the, uh, is that even on our list so I know? Uh, DC, I, I don't have the list, so I have no idea. <laughs> uh, the, well, apparently, DC and Diamond are going to extend their t- partnership temporarily until July 31st. Mm. So yeah, I, I, I yeah that hints I, at what you're saying that they're going to come to some kind of a. I think if they do come to terms of diamond, they're still going to use their other resources. Oh, totally. Well. Oh yeah, no, those resources are there to stay. That yeah. they, my money was spent, contracts have been signed. They're in it for at least a year. But I think that the whole thing was a negotiation tactic to lower rates between Diamond and DC. And to I show think Diamond that, they don't have a monopoly that they they shouldn't have a monopoly. I think it's at the very least. I don't. I don't think that DC did it to help the industry. I think that DC did it because they're stepping away from monthly comics anyway, and they're like, "If I don't need to do business with you, like right. we're we're we're, we're eventually going to go completely autonomous, but for now, we'll we'll you know we'll break bread with you." And yeah, I yeah, think I that for that. for the for the for the most part, this whole thing was a was a stunt to say. We don't need you, see? We 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 went full steam ahead, and the industry responded. And like, you know, as, as it always happens, it didn't really affect as many people as if we made a major change in, like, the TV or movie industry. So, you know, right. what are you going to do now? Um, and also, if Diamond would have lost 30% of their, of their market share, which is devastating. So, Diamond might not exist without DC. We'll yeah, see. I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens to that. But... I do want to move on to a different part of that. To, to tie into that, did you see Marvel's stab at DC? <laughs> it's the yes, stupidest thing I've ever heard of. It, it's, it's, it's so petty. Okay, so what happened, guys, is Marvel decided to remove cover art on top, top 10 of their selling books, and all it says is, available Wednesday. <laughs> That's it. Just, hey... Well, because you can't celebrate being a day behind DC. Like, that's, know. you know, we're sticking to the status quo, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mic drop. Like, that, there's there's no way to celebrate that. They could have <laughs> celebrated by having some cool variants, but instead it's just blank covers with text that says, we're coming out on Wednesdays. Hold yeah. them strong. It's so stupid. Why, like, 
And I love some of the artist response that all Marvel did was find a way to not pay cover artists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it was, it didn't help anybody. It was just, it was, it, you know what it did? It was, it was tone deaf, completely yeah. tone deaf. Yeah. So, okay. Going, going back then, I want to double back again on DC making weird decisions recently. Have I told you my theory about DC universe? Uh, the video goes live tomorrow. The app? And, yeah. No. Okay, so all along we have said, how is DC Universe making money? Who approved this? What is it doing? I've seen zero marketing. <laughs> yes. My, my theory, and it's going to go up on the main channel tomorrow, and I don't mind talking about it here because Absolute Comics kind of has a pseudo-separate audience. Like it, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was supposed to fail. I think uh. it was created as a failure intentionally or with the idea that it could fail. Okay. And the reason is, if you look at the companies that make everything, it's three yeah. companies that pop up on every single production. Berlenti Productions, uh, WB, and DC Entertainment. They make the CW shows. They make all the DC Universe shows. They make all yep. the HBO Max shows. What I think the intention of DC Universe was, was to, because right now, because, okay, if you don't know the process for making a TV show, it goes, hey, CW, we want to make a show about Stargirl. And CW goes, we don't think that'll do well. And then they cut it off there and no funding goes to it. Or yeah. they go, cool, here's a little bit of money to make a pilot. I think DC Universe was an idea internally as a way to f get funding for shows that they think will succeed, but don't have a home. Hmm. So think about this. If I go, okay, so I'm going to make an adult-themed Harley Quinn. I'm going to make a dark and gritty swamp thing. I Because look at the shows that are on there. The only thing that makes sense is Titans. Yes. Like, nobody was like, dude, I want Doom Patrol. I, no. Yeah, I, the Harley Quinn show, I think, was the most successful slash smartest one to make. Because it's lo lower cost um, and more recognizable than any of them. Doom Patrol is way more niche. Um but, Bro, but even the Harley Quinn one, they, they wanted to go a different direction. What yeah. I think the intention was, was to show that there is, in fact, a market for these obscure titles that you don't think will do well. Hmm. And the idea was to put them on DC Universe, show that there is a market, and then go to places like CW and them and go, we already produced it. Now you just right. got to pay us for it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you just got to license it from us. Yeah. That's not a bad move. I, I think that's interesting. Uh, there's a lot of bells and whistles for DC Universe to suggest that, like, if if the whole thing is like a facade, you know, it's like a. It's like I don't a think fake... it's a facade, but I don't think it was intended to hit the giant numbers. Like you and I kept saying, what are they expecting out of this? And I think what they were expecting is to prove that people want it. That's all they right. were trying to prove. Yeah, and have um, a corporation that can request and spend money on these shows. You know, because right. you can't just be like, it's not like they have a you know, a director or a showrunner who's like, I want to make this show. And it's like, so we're going to what give you the money and you'll figure it out. No, it has to be like a, like a, like a production company. Right. That exactly. has to produce the show and DC universe, DC entertainment is the one that does it. Cause I made the comment that star girl is probably one of the best CW shows I've seen to which a bunch of guys pushing up their glasses were like, no, mm -hmm. it's uh, DC it was never universe, made Benny. Yeah. And I, and I responded with, uh, no, it's the same people. Literally, right. if you look at the people that make these shows, there's three companies that is on every single one. They approve the budgeting. They get the cast. They're the ones that help the crossover. How do you think the Titans showed up on the CW crisis event? Because the same companies are making these. What they do is they hire a local company to handle it locally. So right. you get a Canadian company to handle Flash and all those because they're up in Vancouver. But hey, yep. we're going to do Stargirl in LA, so we're going to get an LA company to do the production down here. Yeah, and it's a little cheaper for them because it is in-house. It's on the Warner lot. We don't have to worry about like going, exactly. shooting in locations. Yeah, that's that's not a bad theory. I find that interesting. So from um, a tax purpose, you can't write off, we made a show hoping it would sell. No. But you could go, we invested in this Doom Patrol show because even if we can't sell it, it's going to do get us subscriptions for DC Universe. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's a way to also activate like another revenue stream from something from from because there's no other way to make money off of a show that has right. no platform, right? So I yeah. have this idea because going back to a meeting I had with Sideshow, Sideshow Collectibles creates these crazy statues. They're, they're amazing. awesome. They're incredible. But if you look at half of them, you go, "Why the hell is there a statue for insert obscure DC character?" <laughs> Am I wrong? Like something? No, no, yeah. Like, why is there a no? Why is there a nine hundred dollar statue of insert in like obscure DC character? Like Huntress. There was one for Huntress, nine hundred dollars, and I'm like, no one knows who she is. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, are, if you're a Huntress fan, are you now, like, salivating and freaking out about how awesome that is? Because, you know, Sideshow makes good good statues, and it's going to be, like, of, of high quality. But at the same token, I mean, I, I get that. In the collector's market, you know, obscure doesn't necessarily mean that it won't work. And, of course, you know, as well as I do, that Sideshow doesn't build their statue. Like, if you, they, 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 they make a sculpt, they take a picture of it, they put it on their website, you buy it, but you don't really buy it. You're pre-ordering it, and if they hit a number that is of the pre-orders, then they go to production, which is right. why it takes, like, a year and a half for you to get your statue. Um, so they're proving that there is an, uh, a market for it, and a niche audience that's willing to pay $1,100 for a niche character, you know, if I get enough of them, yep. then it's still worth making. Well, I asked them, why do you make, because they were showing me the this, this Swamp Thing statue, and they're proud of the Swamp yeah. Thing statue. And I asked them, like, I, I love all of your guys' statues, but sometimes I wonder why you chose some of the characters you did. And their answer was simple, because we wanted to do it. We wanted that character. Right. And that's what I feel like DC Universe is. It was like people like Jeff Johns going, I would love to make a Stargirl show. And then Berlenti Productions going, let's make an app. And we, we would will, love to we would we, love to make one with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll fund it and you will make your Star Girl show. It'll live on the app and we're going to try to sell it to CW, HBO Max, all these other homes. Right, right. So it's just it's like Sideshow in terms of it's it's from a pure place where it's like we know these we know these characters can work. We know these shows yes. would be successful, but trying to make deals with the TV people is impossible. Right. We but but they do respond to success awards and money. So yes. if we can get all those things and ascribe them to these shows, it'll be way less work than like, like, can you imagine why there wasn't a Harley Quinn or Deadpool cartoon show on Adult Swim 10 years ago? Like, yeah. And it's just because it costs money. It's about licensing, but it's also about convincing the showrunners that it's going to be successful. And Harley Quinn is on sci-fi. Sci-fi didn't uh, produce none that None of show. the shows on DC Universe are exclusive to DC Universe anymore, are they? Other than maybe Titans? Titans, I think, is the only one. Well, yeah, because Swamp Thing went to CW. Doom Patrol, I don't know about Young Justice, but uh, Doom oh, Patrol's yeah, on too. HBO Max. Um, but again, Harley's like... on Sci-Fi and Stargirl's on CW now. My dad, I would have severe doubts that there is any audience from the production, from the, from the studio side, for Young Justice. You know, like... Titans isn't on Netflix. Tit well, technically, Tit Titans is on Netflix if you're not in America. Yes. Unless, unless they made it like available inside the U.S. It's always been on Netflix, but outside of America. Which, day one, you and I said, that is fishy as hell. Why would you do that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, because you can't get DC Universe outside of the United States. And why did they not push for that? Because it was never intended to be a smashing success. It was intended to sell the shows. Mm. Do you think that because we now have... So I'm thinking an anomaly because that was a mistake. Like they made the show, but they made it for too much money and they, they screwed up the cost, which is yep. why it was canceled so, so sharply. But, uh, but using those examples like Doom Patrol and Harley Quinn and other shows like that, um, Stargirl, um, those shows, because they are successful and they were sold, is that why we're losing DC Daily and probably DC Unscripted? Like, is that why, like, we're starting I to, feel like, like, scale when, back on everything? Like, we don't really, yes. we don't need all these, all these things that, 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 that trick the audience into thinking we're making an app. All oh, right, it's really a production house. Like, we can take this down. We can take out the community room. Like, <laughs> we can stop well, selling I, toys. I, I actually, I agree with you on that. I think what it was, was the original goal was to sell the shows. And they were like, but... If it doesn't work, we need to make the app viable. People, right. <laughs> if people don't come and sign up for the app, we don't prove anything. We've yeah. just made shows. So I think things like DC Daily, I think the community, even they, they still have exclusive toys on there now. Still, they do. Yeah, um, yeah. I think all of that was intended to get people on the subscription service to prove numbers. And the reason we've never seen numbers is they bring them to CW or they bring yeah. them to HBO Max or they bring them to Sci-Fi. They shop them around. Mm -hmm. You know. Because yeah, you can go, absolutely. hey, I know only 10,000 people watched our Titan show, mm -hmm. but imagine 10,000 on a niche app that we don't promote. Now imagine yeah. if you put this on your show. You know what I mean? Like yes. that, that's what I think they were doing. Right, right. Like they probably have metrics to, to say, you know, based on the amount of money we spent on advertising for this, we got this number of people. And if we were to, to multiply it by X, it would yeah. result in this number. And so it, it equates to the numbers of insert you know comparable show that cw produced themselves right yeah so yeah that's what i think i mean that's just my theory but i wanted to get your opinion on that it's gonna i'm putting up a video tomorrow nice so. yeah i don't disagree i think that's a that's a sound theory i mean i'm sure there's you know and, and it's funny because i don't think they counted on dc universe becoming more like the comic book 
reader was more of an afterthought at DC Universe yep. until they saw the numbers and realized, like, oh, my God, people actually go come here for the comics. And they started to, like, really cultivate it and make it more robust. My theory about DC Universe now is that you're going to see more scaling back of original programming, like all the uh, web-based shows that they made. And because I think that DC's whole initiative is going to change... Um, the app will become the new Comixology exclusively for DC. The DC will pull their licensing agreement with Comixology, and DC I Universe s- is the only place you can get DC comics. I still think they're going to do that, though. I think they're going to do, like, Marvel Unlimited, where you yeah. can get more stuff over here, but... Yeah, yeah. That would make sense uh, right. to, to do a Marvel Unlimited as DC Universe. Yeah, then you so. still have Comixology, but you still, you're double-dipping. That's a Marvel Unlimited. Right. Is. It's not, not a bad idea. That makes more money, so... Yeah. Um, all right, moving down to our list of topics here. Immortal She-Hulk is coming out. Okay, when I Yay! saw the I saw the announcement of this, I was like, that makes total sense. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm so on board. Sounds great. Al yeah. Ewing, are you kidding me? Done. Sold. I'm like, American. I'm in. I'm like, why? Why hasn't that? Like, we had a She-Hulk. Why? Why has that not become a thing? Like, <laughs> yeah. How? And it's you know why it hasn't been a thing because they were planning for this probably from the start or at least from the halfway point. Yeah, I mean, he was I'm like, excited. yeah, no, I got plans. I got plans for her. I got yeah. It's it's gonna be good. I'm excited for it. Uh, this Me one's too. gonna be. You're gonna like this one. Emerald City Comic Con officially canceled. I can't. I my friend who lives in Seattle literally texted me before we started the show. He's like, Emerald City's canceled again. Yeah. So we're not going in August. Well, they straight canceled it though. It's a digital show now, and they're gonna cu- they're just gonna come back 2021 March. Okay. So is it gonna be Emerald City Comic Con Online 2020? Yeah. Will we have a panel? I don't know. <laughs> I, <haven't, laughs> I doubt it. They're probably yeah. like a one-day thing. Um, it's funny, is- too, because, like, okay, I'm aware that COVID-19 is not going to be done for the next year or so. Oh, that's right. Uh, mm-hmm. I made a comment on my video I put out today, Death Metal. Okay, first off, I'm not a fan of putting out videos the day of the comics releasing. I do it because co- all of my competitors do it. Right. But I don't like doing it. Now, this of all times, we need people to go to the comic book stores and comicsology and buy the comics. We need you to do yep. so. So I stated at the beginning, and I know I worded it very badly. I know in my head I was saying, the, the, we're done with the rush, uh, the, the a drought of comics. Go to your comic book store and buy the comic and go to Comixology and buy the comic to prove you want these books. You need to help that. I yep. worded it with, now that we're coming to the end of the pandemic. Right. <laughs> well, we're not. But, so uh, everyone but, is in the comments being like, no, who's going to tell yeah. them? <laughs> well, that's fair. Uh, but at least, I mean, like, listen, as a country, we're pretending like we're done with the pandemic. Oh my so. God, I hate those people. I go, I go nuts. I, I got to go to the grocery store. And there's like a whole family, no masks, just kind of like weaving around me. Like, get the fuck away. Like, yeah, <laughs> no, our, our comic book store just opened on Monday. I have not been yet. Uh, they are doing significant social distancing plus masks uh, as a requirement. But the fact is like your comic book stores have all innovated and, and created new ways of selling your books to you without you going. Um, just pre-order the book get a pull list, get a mailing order, and you'll get your books to you at your house, you know, without any trouble. Just do that if you need to prove that the comic, you know, is is valuable. You know, if you need to, to, if, if, if you want the book to succeed, you need to buy it. So if you need to buy it, take the steps you need to get it as safely as possible. Yeah, and that's just it. I mean, the industry, we, we need people to go out and buy comics right now. We need, we need it to, because we just had that weird... You know yeah. what I mean? Like that weird oh, yeah. thing. Right. Weird time of three months of no comics, which made no sense because Diamond doesn't know how to budget. Yep. <laughs> yep. Well, and and because, uh, yeah, Marvel and DC didn't stop production. They just stopped printing, which uh, is fair. Um, but they, they could have three months of leeway. Yeah. And, and, and I think it would have been shorter if Diamond wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't the way it is. Their head up their asses? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've met the people at Diamond at a party, and they were the kind of guys that introduced themselves like, I'm Diamond. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I know who I am. Like, I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah, like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's this call. This is what we're going to yeah. have here. Yeah, right? Cool. Okay, well, then we won't be doing business together. <laughs> so, all right, moving on to the next topic on the list here. Uh, sorry, I do apologize if we feel like we're moving a little quick. We literally are. <laughs> yep. We have an yep. interview with Sean Gordon Murphy after this that's going to go on the video. Um, Emerald City Black Cat makes her own Iron Man suit and it looks awesome. Not much to I discuss. Saw that. It I just looks cool. That. Yeah, it looks cool. 
you know, I'm thinking we need, oh, shit, you know, because cool. <laughs> right? I'm thinking it's time. You know, we haven't had this in a long time. We're getting a new creative team on Iron Man. Uh, Where everyone new- is making Iron Man suits again. That's what I want. I want to see basically the armor wars, but like flipped again, where it's like Iron Man makes a suit of armor for everybody. I, and I, then everybody I, gets a sweet armor. <laughs> that's one of the things that has never made sense in the Marvel Universe. Like, just like Punisher shouldn't exist in this world. Right. <laughs> Just like yeah. Wolverine cannot possibly be on three teams a day. Nope. Uh, just like, you know, Spider-Man's webbing somehow is never found, even though it dissolves in an hour, someone would find the hour. Uh, right. <laughs> another one that has never made sense is, why does an Iron Man just give everyone a suit of armor? <laughs> right. Uh, I think, and, and it and doesn't I, have to be like an Iron Man armor. It could be like Spider-Man's Civil War II version. That, oh, that's the thing is I'm, I'm f- like, in my head... The the new Armor Wars event would be that he already made them all. That like everyone has a suit of armor. <laughs> They've all turned like, it down. Well, no, no, no. Just like he's never really. They, they, it's never come up. Like there's never been a chance for him to give it to them. And like Spider Man has to wear if he's gonna be involved. He has to wear the suit I made for you during Civil War, pal. Right. Come on, try it on. You know you like it. <laughs> you know, like, it would be fun. I think that would be really cool. And plus, like, wouldn't it be neat to see, like, armor for characters that either died or haven't existed? Like, I've been making them since 1975. Like, there's there's a Captain Marvel, like, you know, Kree warrior Captain, like, Iron Man suit. Like, there's suits for everybody. And, like, so the champions show up and they're like, you didn't make us one? He's like, yeah, put on one for a character that doesn't exist anymore. Like, put on, I don't know. Nah, never mind. Just, you uh- know. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I think it looks awesome. I like Black Cat. We're about to do the Spider-Man Black Cat arc on the channel now that we're getting some more Gamerverse stuff. So, that's going to be cool. Uh, moving on to the next one. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, Bendis is now inventing the Gold Lanterns. I, I uh, Pass. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be the Legion of Superheroes. They're a Gold Lantern. I think that once Bendis is done with the Legion of Superheroes... They are going to throw everything he did away. I could see it. Like, because he isn't even trying. And no one at DC wants to do what he's doing or cares about it. I've noticed that. Like, we had the talk with Scott and he was like, hey, uh, yeah, no, everyone here at DC, we're trying to be on a continuity. We're trying to do our own thing. We're trying to make it all work, make it all one big cohesion family here. And every time Bendis does something new, it shows up nowhere. Right, like, <laughs> well, because because like uh, he has no respect for what you're doing. Why should they? And I agree, but I don't know. It's it's weird. It's weird what's going on. And now he's leaving Superman. So yeah, not much more to say about the Gold Lantern. I like Green no. Lantern. I'd love to see what's going to happen with that. But at this point, ever since Jeff Johns, we've had the Omega Lantern. We've had the Gray Lantern, the Phantom Lantern. Now we get the Gold Lantern. We got do the, something don't with the, some lantern, please. <laughs> don't forget the infrared spectrum lantern. Oh, yeah, ultraviolet. What's going oh, on? Ultraviolet that? spectrum. Uh, nothing. Um, but that came up. Don't forget about the proto white lantern ring from Batman Universe that may or may not be in continuity. Oh, no, that, that's not proto. That is a white lantern ring. It's just the first white lantern ring. Right. But developed by the Owens. Yeah. Huh. Weird. There's a lot of, yeah. I feel like a, they keep adding to the Green Lantern mythos, but they don't want to do a Green Lantern sh- like comic that no. follows that. They want to just let Grant Morrison do his space cop thing. Well, Grant Morrison wants nothing to do with any of that. So, <laughs> the, you know, it, and, and I, I guarantee in his contract, there's a, you can't make a competing Green Lantern book while I'm working on this book. Oh, yeah, no, 100%. Why do you think that there is no other Green Lantern book, period? It's because they absolutely would. Because you know there's like a huge amount of Green Lantern fans who are like, I don't like this. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I don't mind it, but I, w- I would 100% prefer my space operas instead. Yeah, yeah. Um, like and, they, they should have a Green Lanterns book out Well, right there was now. Green Lantern Core and Green Lantern at Rebirth. They got rid of all that stuff to make room for Grant Morrison's Green Lantern, so. I know, I know. Um, all right, so moving on, we've got HBO Max and DC decide to team up to create their own comic showing ordinary people becoming superheroes. Oh. What? Yeah, the... It's an HBO Max tie-in comic about like characters that get like the powers of HBO Max. You know, like it, it's a com- it's a commercial. Oh, okay. I don't care. Moving on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> this is like when you have like a PSA with Spider Man. All right, kids. Or, or, or the or the Justice League teaming up with Colonel Sanders and stuff in those no, KFC no. books. Like the Flash and KFC books are amazing. <laughs> yeah, but is it canon? 
I think it is. I think Ugh. I think there is a Colonel Sanders universe. Yeah. Pass. <laughs> Uh, all sucks. right, so Warner Brothers officially end HBO Go and HBO Now to fully replay. Thank God, because when HBO Max dropped, all I saw was, here's how it all works and why it's confusing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, also, like, it's not HBO. You know, like, you got HBO Go, which is just HBO on your phone. Right. And only on demand. You can't yep. just, like, watch it, like, streaming. Um, you can't watch it, like... In real time, like whatever's on HBO, you just watch it. Um, but HBO Max is just like, well, it ha- we want the prestige of HBO, and we have no good ideas. <laughs> so it's called HBO Max. I mean, like, I think HBO Max is a great idea to just do their competing service. Yeah. I don't understand why. It feels like it was rushed out because there's nothing unique on it. As soon as I opened it up, I'm like, I had access to all of this already. <laughs> you didn't have access to that new Looney Tunes cartoon, though. But you know what I mean. Like, everything that yeah. I would have cared about, I had access to. Like, uh-huh. like watch Westworld. Already did that. Watch yeah. Game of Thrones. Already watched that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Like, no, Disney Plus came out with a bunch of stuff that wasn't on anything before it. Yeah. And yeah, it's there's Warner nothing Brothers. on there that I care about right now, but Mandalorian's coming. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> they need to they need to rush because Disney Plus is a waste in my opinion too. But uh, yeah, but Mandalorian justifies its entire existence. Well, yeah, but you could cancel until Mandalorian comes back. That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moving no, I have, on. To, I have to watch the 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 documentary of Mandalorian. Uh, moving on, X of Swords has been scheduled for release in November. Finally, twenty four parts, Benny. X of Swords is 24 okay. issues, including two prologues. So it's really 22 issues. Oh, I, I have a question for you. Remember how I'm always arguing that we need to just have regular Green Lantern? We just, just need to have a regular Batman book in the side? You know what? Uh-huh. I, 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 I always, I'm always like, oh, I hate the X-Men. I hate the X-Men. What I hate is Jonathan Hickman's X-Men. I hate the convoluted X-Men. Just make an X-Men book on the side that I can read that is just what I want out of my X-Men. Do that. I, there, there are a couple of like the fact is there are so many X titles. Like if you read Marauders or X, maybe you might like Excalibur, but like they're all different stuff. They're doing their own thing. Like, now Excalibur there's 24 is twenty-four issues. Yeah, but those twenty-four issues are part of basically it's co-opting all the X Men books that are out right now, plus the main title. It's just Hickman is commandeering all those titles that they made and being like they're all part of X of Swords now. It's ten of swords, but you know, it, it. Yes, it's not really twenty-two or twenty-four individual issues called ten of swords number one through twenty-four. It's just that it's going to be like Maximum Carnage, where it's a fourteen-part epic that goes across like four different Spider-Man titles. You know, it, it's just it's just that. But leading up to ten of swords, you could have read New Mutants, and it was nothing like X-Men, was nothing like Wolverine, was nothing like X-Force, was nothing like. Marauders was nothing like, you know, uh, Fallen Angels. Like, they're all different titles. Yeah. Um, just that he's coalescing them all into this freaking event, which is not the culmination of the Hickman X-Men plan. This is just the next step yeah. in this massive thing that if you're not on board, you know, you're not going to be reading X-Men for a while. Um, <sighs> I, haven't read them in, I haven't read them in a while. X-Men Red was the last time I enjoyed it. No, oh, then, yeah, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but move. I promise you, when 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 Age of Apocalypse comes in, because I promise you, the event that they call that X, I guarantee you, the Hickman event that will be the Secret Wars of X Men is going to be called Age of Apocalypse. I can see that too. <laughs> now nah, he didn't call Secret Wars Secret Wars Five. <laughs> no, he called it Secret Wars 2015. So it'll be Age of Apocalypse 2023. Because how long it takes yes. to get to it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's exactly what we're going to get. All right. Uh, last topic here. There's, I don't know how true this is, but Bleeding Cool is running the rumor that uh, Punchline might get her own comic. Uh, if DC wants money, she will. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't understand the fascination with Punchline, in all honesty. Um, she's Harley Quinn the way Harley Quinn was 15 years ago. I think the Punchline, it's interesting because Punchline is essentially a zenial. Yeah, And it's just she, it's funny because she's in college and she thinks she knows everything and she doesn't. And she's like, I'm looking forward to the fall of Punchline because she's like clearly in over her head and she has no idea what, what's coming. And it's just like, it. that's kind of fascinating. Um, I, I don't have any. 
I find it weird that she's getting her own character. I just feel like it's yeah. weird that we're getting her own comic and we barely have her in the current comics. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's not like I, she had a whole arc, a part of this Joker war, and we're all like, wow, nope. she did so well. We love her. I feel like yeah. this is DC trying the Gwenpool thing. We came out with the design. You all liked it. Let's see what yep. happens. Yep, that's it. I mean, it's just, well, it, it just makes financial sense. Yeah. Um, I, it ain't for me. Like, I'm not going to be reading the punchline book. Oh, I will. But, you know me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, if, knock yourselves out. Like, have a good time. Because uh, I know that that book's for somebody. And Tynan's story of her, like, her origin in the Joker 80th anniversary book, I was like, uh, at first I was like, what a stupid thing. And then I thought about it for, like, ten minutes. Tiffany helped me with that. She, I was just like, oh, that's clever and interesting, and I wonder where that's going, but I also don't care. Like, she's not for me. Yeah. Mm, that's fine. Like, not, like, go ahead. She's a fan oh. of the Joker who wants yeah. to be his partner. Exactly. She's not his exactly. girlfriend. She's clarified No. That. Everyone says yeah, that it's his new girlfriend. It's not. It's no. She's his own, like, she's her own separate person who works with the Joker. Yeah, she's homaging Joker. She thinks yeah. she's, like, the next generation of Joker. Yeah. Like, her costume reflects Joker's costume, whereas Harley is her own character that was intrinsically connected to Joker until they realized that she would make more money if she wasn't. Like, yeah. No, I, yeah. I think that there's a future for Punchline. I don't want one because I don't like redundancies. Like, I'm a care. I'm a person who's like, I like Joker. Joker should have hoodlums that he kills. Yeah. Like, Joker does not have partners or sidekicks or, you know, like, I don't want to see, like, a grand finale with Batman and Punchline in the background going, like, me too! Like, I, you know, I, I don't need these hangers on in my enduring myths. You know what I mean? Like, right. Hercules doesn't have, like, a cute sidekick or, like, an ex-girlfriend that hangs around. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, when you're talking about your pantheon and your myths, keep them simple. Stupid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, all right, well, we're going to wrap up today's episode because we are going to roll into an all, not live interview. Uh, if you guys are wondering why we're not doing it live, it's really simple. We don't do these interviews with creators live because we don't want them bombarded with questions and stuff that they can't answer live. It makes for an awkward show, but we can film yeah. it off the air and we are easily able to go, oh, oh we shouldn't ask about that. So um, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we're going to go do that. So it is a shorter episode today, but you're going to have, when you watch this on the Patreon, which is uh, patreon.com slash comic story and patreon.com slash comic pop. It's the same episode that goes up on either one uh, yep. or you watch this on YouTube. It'll have that in there. Um, and you'll be able to see the interview that way. And if it's long enough, it'll become its own episode on comic story. And so you'll see it there as well. So you'll have two potential ways to see the, uh, uh, the Sean Gordon Murphy interview, the creator of curse of the white knight. We're going to primarily be talking about his Indiegogo project though, but he wants to talk yep. about that. So, um, and hey, if you if you're not if you if you if you if you're not ready to leave, Tiffany's playing Batman right now, so I, you can watch I her. I haven't gotten to that yet. That well, good. you told me to remind you. That was a friendly way to remind me, I guess. All right, guys. So we'll talk to you a little bit. Thank you so much for joining us for this quick episode today. We'll be back on Thursday with uh, Comics Experiment and Superhero D and D Capes and Pals. Um, and on next Monday, we'll be back with the Tales of the Earth crew. And then on next Tuesday, Sal and I will be back. We're here every Tuesday again. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you Thursday. Oh, Thursday. <laughs> hey, everyone. Not sure where this is going to go at the moment, but it's probably going to turn into its own episode or be attached to a previous podcast. But Sal and I had the honor of talking to Sean Gordon Murphy, who you may know from writing Curse of the White Knight, and his amazing artwork, his amazing storylines. And he's wa and he wants to talk about his new book that he's creating on Indie. It is Indiegogo, right? Not Kickstarter? That is, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's called okay. Plot Holes. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're fine. Uh, so we're going to talk very briefly about what 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 allowed him to come to his conclusions to change up the Batman mythos the way he did. And then we're going to talk about his new book, because if he wrote something as incredible as Curse of the White Knight, I'm excited to see what he's going to be doing with his own creator own projects. Well, thank you so, so much, Ben. And it's good to finally uh, meet you. Uh, I've been watching your stuff even before. I mean, you've been really kind enough to review my stuff, but uh, I've always enjoyed watching you act out all these books and all that uh it helps me get through the day honestly <laughs> um and uh yeah i just assume you had some kind of crazy uh performance art background because you do such a good joker voice not really uh like i was telling you before uh i did public speaking in the military so like i yeah. can project very well 
And outside right. of that, I just have a range of what weird things I can do with my voice that seem to work for right. this. So yeah, no, it's I've thought about man. getting into of... voice acting, but I like comic books and doing this too much. So no, there's, there's a ton of introverts in comics. It's nice to see someone that's as outgoing as you are. So thanks for being here. <laughs> well, thank you for being on our show. Uh, Sal, yeah, everyone who know who watches the show is going to know Sal. He's from the Comic Pop channel. He joins me as a co-host of most of my shows. Sal, I'm sure you've got some questions you want to ask. Why don't you start with our, our, our five-minute Curse of the White Knight talk? I'll let you take the first question in case it takes up all of the curses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have this tendency to, to go on, so I'll try to keep it as, as, as brief as possible. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, man. Let's do it. Uh, you, you started off with, uh, with White Knight where you told this kind of like distilled, you know, f- amazing meatloaf of a Batman story and then kind of exploded <laughs> with Curse of the White Knight. Uh, you create and generate a mythos and uh, like a kind of backstory. Was that always in the back of your mind when you were working on the first iteration or when you got to do a sequel, you were like, I'm going to just go ham on this story. Yeah. Um, so I think at about issue six, I, I, in the first volume is when I started to think about a sequel um, <clears throat> because the sales were, were high and the reception was great. And DC was already talking about doing a sequel at some point. So I sort of um, added some stuff to the uh, last few issues to set myself up for volume two, basically. Um, like I, I there's some lines that go, if you go back and read volume one, you'll see some stuff that Joker says offhandedly that totally fit in with Curse of the White Knight. Um, nice. I imagine for the reader that reads them both back to back, you're really going to see a lot of threads that, that really don't skip a beat, you know? Yeah. I, awesome. my, plan, my plan was always to, uh, I'll just kill Batman at the end of it because no one ever kills Batman. <laughs> right. And then as I got to the end of volume one, I'm like, ah, I should leave him alive. And then uh, as I got to the end of Curse, I'm like, ah, I guess I should leave him alive. <laughs> <laughs> you feel it when you're reading that story, like where, you know, you're like getting to the good death that Batman's chasing. And each yeah. time you get there, you narratively weave in a, a legitimate reason for him not to die and for it to keep yeah. going. <laughs> right. Where yeah. like no. yeah, what that I love about that things. is it being that it's a separate universe and we know that that all all bets are off. Exactly. Like as we've seen with other alternate universe long form stories, you're like anybody could die at any moment. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So me spoilers. You know, Gordon died. Alfred dies. Uh, you almost think Batgirl is, dies or is paralyzed. Um, but yeah, I mean that's kind of the funny thing is uh, someone I think it might have been you guys who reviewed it and said that uh, Sean um, is slaughtering all the sacred cows. Like all the things that you're not supposed to do in continuity. Like we don't know if all these characters are gonna make it to the end. Cause like yeah. Sean is obsessed, obsessed with killing off characters. And uh, the trick for me is like, I wanna give them good, valuable deaths. I don't wanna just sweep them away. Um, but I also get overwhelmed with so many characters uh, that I, my, my brain goes to, well, just kill this character off. So that way you don't have to write them anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe a little bit too much, honestly. And, um, this, it would be, it would be hard for me to be on a main continuity story because every time I got bored, I couldn't just kill off a character because you just can't right. do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you so can I'm probably you just have, like Superboy prime. Yeah. Stuff, they're all back. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm probably best utilized by DC over my own corner where everyone can die. Um, right. As long as the book is selling and people are generally happy, then DC is happy. But uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll step into mainstream one day, but uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you were formulating the, the original White Knight, and I kept calling it the Curse Universe. It's the White Knight Universe. I don't know why I kept calling it the Curse Universe, but everyone yeah, gets it. it. They know what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Call whatever you want, man. It's fine. <laughs> when you were originally creating the idea, I know, and I, I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know if we, you talk about this or whatever. When it first came out, it was called White Knight. And of course, you got a lot of backlash from the various groups. Were you like, oh, they're going to love this when it finally comes out and sees it? It's, it's not what they're all thinking it is. No. Because I know, you know the moment it was announced, it was like, <laughs> Batman, White Knight, I got so many messages of like, could you believe what they're doing? And I'm like, let's see what it is. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, I appreciate you withholding judgment. Um, you know, the, the phrase White Knight wasn't really triggery back when I was concocting this. I mean, this would be late 2016, early 2017. And um, the culture w- was just not as volatile. Um as it might be now. And my, my, the whole time, my only thought was, well, we have the Dark Knight, so 
it doesn't really make sense to call this the light night because that doesn't make any sense. So we'll call <laughs> it the white night. And I'm aware of the, the phrase and how, you know, Batman's a white guy and he's going to swoop in and save Gotham's problem. Like I was definitely aware of that. But um, the race stuff hadn't uh, wasn't what it is now. So, I mean, right. if I was relaunching the series, I don't know if I would choose to call it White Knight. Um, but like any title, uh, eventually people just accept it and don't even think about that stuff. I suppose uh, like a new reader might get to yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And now it's yeah. just, they just, you can call it Batman Jelly Beans. And, it, and after a while, Batman <laughs> Jelly Beans sounds like totally natural, you know? Right. I would love a reboot of this universe as Batman jelly beans. <laughs> and you just like throw in things or just Batman's eating jelly beans between things. That's the whole reason. Like yeah. Yeah. only the black ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, like we, we, we knew we were only going to talk briefly about white Knight universe in general, it, it, but overall Sal, Sal and I are huge fans of what you've created. And we're super excited about what you're going to be doing with it. Yeah. Thanks, but yeah, before that comes out, you've got this other creator-owned project, which you've reached out to us about. That's why we're talking here today. Why don't yeah. you tell us a little bit about it so we can ask questions about it? Right. So um, the name of this book is called The Plot Holes. It's uh, the story that I've been kicking around for a while. My, my business plan has been to do some Batman, then do my own creator-owned thing, and then go back and do Batman. Kind of like what Clint Eastwood does, I think, it, or George Clooney. They have this mentality of like one for them, one for me. Yeah. So the Batman is, is you know, it's for me too because I love Batman. But I definitely wanted to get back to my indie roots um, and try something new going straight through crowdfunding. I knew I wanted to use like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, so I came up with this idea called Plot Holes. And uh, I wanted to design a, a, a title where I could really flex my muscles as far as drawing all kinds of different things. So um, the story is about a comic book artist who realizes that his world is not real. It's actually all inside of a novel and the novel sucks and it's about to be deleted. And he and everything in his world is about to basically get deleted too. And um, this woman comes to him and her name is the editor. She goes, well, what we do is we hop from book to book, fixing all these plots, saving these books. Because if we can get these books publishable then we can save these universes. Unfortunately, your book is terrible. <laughs> and you're going to die. So if you want to live, come with us and you can join our team. And we're made basically a bunch of misfits from books that got canceled. Um, so basically the idea is kind of like Men in Black meets Quantum Leap, where they hop yeah. into different universes. And the, uh, I, I designed it this way because I always, like I love drawing so many different genres and I can never have enough. I thought, this is great. They can drop into a samurai book. They can drop into a sci-fi book. They can go into ancient Egypt, scuba diving, like whatever the hell I want to draw, I can just write into these scripts. And then uh, if I do a sequel, I can just make it. I don't have to start like, a, I don't have to create like the screw on head. Um, I can create like a kind of my version of Hellboy where Hellboy could plop into any world and sort of scratch the itch of these different things that I want to draw. Um, and the main character being a comic book artist is also a very like meta textual type of thing. And uh, this guy has got a lot of the same insecurities that I do. He's uh, probably spends too much time on Twitter. Like I have from time to time. And uh, <laughs> Don't go yeah, to Twitter it's, ever. It's, yeah, no, <laughs> there's, there's some fun uh, meta textual context that's the, that I get to uh, poke fun at, which I think is, is pretty fun. But uh, yeah, the team itself, you have like a character that's straight out of a manga. So he has like huge eyes and he looks like a Gundam pilot. Then you have a character who's out of a comic strip. He looks like Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes. You have a, a vampire assassin. You have like a traditional superhero villain. And they're just these misfits that are plucked out of different worlds to create this team. And uh, they're just trying to survive by um, publishing as many books as they possibly can. So they kind of exist in like a matrix type of database, I guess. Okay. That's that sounds amazing. <laughs> it sounds amazing and very weirdly meta because right now uh, I'm, I'm doing a, a Dungeons and Dragons themed thing on the channel in which the my two players are Booster Gold and Blue Beetle jumping in and out of the multiverse of DC so that I can play in whatever universe they go into, be it wow. like White Knight or going into like Injustice yeah. or things. So it's just kind of weird that you're like, I'm drawing a comic about so I can <laughs> put them in wherever I want them to go. Yeah. Are you <laughs> And you're, you're the DM on this? Yeah, yeah. You've got it with your voice. You must be like an amazing DM. I hope that you're videotaping it and 
Oh, it's there. been going up on the channel. Yeah, it's Booster Gold okay, and Blue Beetle's <laughs> Misfit Adventures right now. We just had them that's go great. into the He-Man and Justice universe, and like they're riding on the monsters and things. <laughs> that's that's amazing. That's a total like kitchen sink universe where anything goes. That's that's yeah. great. But I just find it funny that that's literally the plot to your story there. That it's about yeah. going through. <laughs> well, so I'm a, a huge a fan of your art. Yours. What's that? Do you ever do a book of? Have you ever make a comic book out of yours? Maybe I can do like a variant cover or something. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> if I ever get DC to give me the okay to just take Booster Gold and Blue Beetle and run with them, we're all. <laughs> yeah, they're known for letting people do whatever they want with their characters, pretty much. Oh yeah. <laughs> Maybe Booster Gold. I mean, they don't seem to care what happens to him. So. <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, but with your with your book idea, what is what came first? You wanting to draw whatever you wanted? or you, the idea for the book in general? Uh, you know, kind of the same time. I, I've had this idea for a while um, of kind of like, what if it, the Men in Black, I don't know, or what if it's like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and they're just these misfits and, they, and I get to draw all these different things that I wanted to do. So like maybe to answer your question, I guess I'd say the exercise of drawing so many different genres is what motivated me. And then I tried to come up with an idea of a, for a script around these characters. Um, okay. And it's something that my brain would revisit a few times a month and I would tell my wife about it. And she's like, I really like this idea. And I go, I don't know. It's kind of hard to describe. You know, I mean, even the quick pitch I just gave you took like two minutes and I had to use voices and inflection to, you know, it's like not necessarily <laughs> the, the easiest elevator pitch. Right. Um, so I'm hoping that when the, the, when the book comes out, people will get it like that and uh, the rest will be history. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I felt the pressure like, when you go off and do your own thing, normally people expect you to do, you know, guy with a gun who won't take no for an answer or <laughs> your, your version of Youngblood or Wildcats or X-Men or, you know, JLA or Batman. Like they just kind of, they need like the quick, like, okay, so Sean's doing his version of this. Got it. Right. Um, when it came to plot holes, it's like, what are you doing? It's, it was kind <laughs> of like a, a record scratch. And people would, were, were thinking like, I'm not saying I'm not interested, but it, it's just a very uh, high concept kind of hard to wrap your brain around type of pitch. And um, my impression is that people are going in on it just because they, they trust me after Batman. They know I'm not going to screw them over. <laughs> right. right. I mean, your art alone sells me on products. Like, like oh, there's, oh, there's yeah. a few artists out there uh, in, in today we're talking to you. So obviously, but there's a few artists that I will buy whatever you guys draw just in general, just because I love the right. artwork. White Knight could have been a, just a trash fire. And I would have been like, the art is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. You know, yeah, every day when I'm trying, there's plenty of times where I want to just cut co copy panels and try to take a half day and phone it in. But I just, I don't know, my OCD kicks in and I really just want to make every page as good as I possibly can make it. Like I'm aware that people generally see me as an artist who kind of writes. And I honestly don't really think of myself as a writer writer, um, but I can sort of write one script a year. And because I know the artist, because it's me, like I can fix a lot of the, the plot holes and tweak things at the last minute, things that other writers really can't do. So um, as long as I can write like generally like a B to B plus level script and then draw it into an A level, I'll fool people into thinking that I'm a real writer. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to look at it, I guess. Yeah, whatever uh, it sells. <laughs> yeah, because your art is just so distinct. Like not, you can look at it and you go, that is a Sean Gordon. I mean, they, they I've been tricked with the Batman animated adventures because you did the, some of the cover for that. And I'm like, yeah. this is going to be great. Oh, no, we're doing that <laughs> art again. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, that was a real struggle, that cover. Uh, like I love working with Paul Dini and I'd love to hook up with him again. But I wasn't sure if I should do my thing or if I should sort of try to do an animated series version of my thing. Right. And honestly, I, I, I'd love another crack at it because that was I'm still not settled on how that cover came out. And I wish I could do it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sal, do you want to ask anything about plot holes? Well, the plot hole sounds uh, it sounds like you love to mash styles because Batman White Knight is a mash of everything you seem to love about Batman blah, into one thing. Puddles yeah. <laughs> is all these things you you love into one thing. It's, it's essentially Wreck-It it's Wreck Ralph meets Cool World, and I am Perfect. I'm Perfect. so on board for that because it's like you you get to play. Mm. Have you ever seen the episode of Futurama where Fry goes into all the different stories and oh, yeah. like oh, yeah, yeah, dreams of articles of interest volume one and two yeah yeah exactly it's so great yeah. uh, but it reminds me of that where it's like it's collecting all these different characters and 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 seeing those characters from the perspective of like the reader as opposed to like from their own vantage point um 
Right. I, I love this concept. Uh, I want to see it. How long do you expect it to be? Well, we just expanded it. Um, we had so much of a, a boost to the Indiegogo campaign that we threw in another issue. So the ori- first idea was to do four chapters, four issues, basically. So okay. 88 pages, more or less. Um, and I'm doing this thinking one day it might get broken up and then split into issues. Yeah. So I'm trying to kind of plan ahead, but who, who knows what's going to happen. But okay. um, we got so much uh, interest right away that we passed our goal. So I increased it to five issues. So it's basically 120-ish pages of story. Plus, um, I'm going to be hiring my friends to do backup, little backup stories in it, just like quick black and white, like five to 10 page stories. And then have like a ton of back matter, scan the raw pencils, uh, concept art, you know, photos. Uh, I actually made a model of the spaceship, which I'm going to give away in the Indiegogo. Nice. Um, So really like for, when we were doing the best we can on price, because with shipping disrupted with what's going on in the world right now, unfortunately, a lot of my European readers are not going to be able to get a good deal on shipping, obviously. Yeah. But for, I think it's like between... It's either twenty, thirty, or fifty dollars, depending on if you want soft cover, hard cover. You're getting about one hundred and seventy p seventy pages of content, which is considering I'm not Amazon and I don't have that output, is the best price I can possibly give my readers. So I'm hoping that they'll see the cost benefit analysis. <laughs> Definitely. Well, um, I think a lot of people that go to Indiegogo's and Kickstarters, they understand that things are going to be a little different. You're not Amazon. Yeah. You're not a big publisher. You can't just mass right. produce thousands of books. Uh, my experience with people running the, a lot of these, that it's not too much of an issue when it's priced reasonable. You right. know, if, yeah, you, if you were like, hey, guys, it'll be $300 for one issue. Then people yeah. might be questioning you. But, yeah. No. No, there's some people that are selling like a single floppy for $30. And I feel like if I tried to do that with my customers, I would just get raked. I, I just yeah. don't see, you know, like, I, I don't know. We all have different, different, like what works for artist X doesn't necessarily work for me. And I'm trying to keep the cost down. Like even with the, um, the digital file of the book, it's only $10, which is less than what most companies will give you for, for five issues, basically. Um, and I feel like the overhead on producing that is so low. There's no, no reason why I need to, you know, charge people $4 an issue. Like, like what, what is the tradition this far, you know? So I'm kind of experimenting yeah. with different models. We'll kind of see what happens. I mean, the, the, the pandemic really threw a wrench into our plans. Um, we're still on top. We're still happy we're doing it, but we definitely had to go to plan B and plan C a few times, but we're going to get it done. It's going to look awesome. No one who backs it ever has to worry. And uh, I'd love to do a sequel at some point too. Nice. I was actually going to go through the points here because uh, <laughs> your pricing is really, because I've, in all honesty, you sent it over and I hadn't, I didn't even open up outside of your opening trailer. You're, so you're a busy I, guy, man. I didn't you're even look to at buy the price do- points. You're, you're looking at dogs today and, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff's going, hitting the fan. It's just because it's, it's Colorado and you find the dog you want, you got to go. My brother went and got, exactly. got himself a dog this morning, which was really oddly coincidental, but we didn't plan that at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And he said there was a line of 10 people to get a dog. What? At the place. Oh. Yeah. So I was like, that's why I'm like, I got to call and get an answer and go. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, but you know, yeah, I used to digital- do a, what's that? A non sequitur. I used to do spays and neuters for free for charity. Uh, no my way. friend was a nurse and uh, I found I had a really good blood tolerance. Like I can see a lot of bleeding and not get freaked out. Um, nice. it never has come in handy other than that. It's a little <laughs> fact for you. But when it does, it will be very off- in handy. <laughs> I've cut the balls off of many dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just going to go through your pricing structure here. Your digital copy of Plot Holes is only $10. Uh, yep. You got the print pack add-on. Is that like a postcards kind of situation? Yeah, like there'll be prints inside the book. They won't be 11 by 17, but there'll be collectible prints that you can frame and stick on the wall. Okay. Uh, and then the soft cover is only $30 for I believe 30. You said, yeah. Yeah, for 170 pages. Uh, and then you can get the hard cover for 50 and you have it down mm-hmm. here for soft and hard cover for just $80 to get both copies of that. Yep, yep. Um, there's a few yeah. in here for retailers. There's a few larger options. I'm not going to go through all of them just because yeah, we, we some have of our a, an artist, probably won't need this. Yeah, so, we have an artist edition too, which will be printed out 11 by 17 large nice. scanned raw files. So it's for the, uh, the process junkies and the art nerds. <clears throat> It'll just be the first two issues, not the whole thing. We, we tried this with the uh, Tokyo Ghost back in the day. And uh, we found that people really like these uh, these things. I don't know how much they cost, uh, 40 or 50, I think. But yeah, um, yeah they're really collectible. People seem to love them. And um, yeah, we're happy to, to, to print them out if we can. But yeah, you mentioned the retailers too. That was one worry I had because I've 
you know, retailers have done so well by me and I want to do well by them. There's no way I wanted to like walk into the uh, self-publishing world without having a tier for retailers. Um, and uh, I know that a lot of retailers, like it's a risk if you're not selling anything other than Batman. So I'm hopefully yeah. offering a low enough price where they can share it with their friends at least or get some kind of a discount. Uh, I wish I'd seen this earlier. Be drawn into plot holes. Already sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe totally... live one more. Just, just, for you. <laughs> <laughs> just to have us in the background. That would have been cool. Uh, but yeah, no, the, the, it seems like a great value. You get your amazing art with it. You get one of your original uh, storylines with it. Uh, is there anything else? You, like anybody who's still not sold in the project, what could you do to sell them to go to your Indiegogo? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> man you did such a good job. I, you know, I was going to have... Um, I had these Skype sessions that sold out quickly. I was actually going to have a tier where people would fly. We would hang out in person. So have like a people would fly to Maine. I put them up. Um, we go to a bar, a restaurant, come show you my studio. I'll give you a ride in my dots and, and kind of like, you know, the super exclusive experience or whatever. Um, like I've spent a lot of time with my readers at shows and I've done these sort of events before and like my readers are really the best and I've never, I mean, they're, they're so great and I really love everybody. I've never had a bad encounter. So I definitely trust, um, people for now. We'll see what happens if it goes, if it goes badly, <laughs> you know, hear about it on these <laughs> in, in my experience of dealing with a lot of like fans and stuff like that, I think I've only ever had like one or two bad experiences. And I think mostly yeah. it's because the comic book fan base isn't really problematic people. It's a lot of introverts who just kind of want to yeah. hang out and yeah. It'll yeah, start they mean well. They really yeah. mean well. And even like some sometimes on uh, social media, you'll read something that sounds rude. But if you imagine that they speak German and they're doing their best to speak English, and then you read it through those lens, that lens, it's like it doesn't seem so offensive anymore. Like, right? Yeah, yeah. I know we're all still trying to wrap our head around how to how to people on social media. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, it's just like the ones who are trying to like, I'm sorry, but I'm actually going to correct you now. It's like, I know you're <laughs> yeah. well-intentioned. Yeah, that don't. guy. <laughs> yeah, that guy. That's what it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. Like, when you do these shows enough and you're on my side of the table, you have, like, generally 10 different types of readers that you kind of run into over and over and over again. You have, like, girlfriend or wife who's there for her husband who has no idea what comics are, doesn't care who you are, and is mad that she just waited in line. <laughs> You've got, uh, you know, 15 year old who lives with mom. His mom's right there. He, uh, you know, super shy. You've got like guy that doesn't seem like he should be in comics at all. Like, what are you doing here? You seem very normal. And you've right. got, you know, the, the typical type of people that you would see in shops. And yeah, it's really funny to see, like, you can kind of switch gears. Like, oh, it's that guy again. It's that guy. And even though they're different people, maybe this is just me just <laughs> oversimplifying. But I find that I generally have 10 types of people over and over and over again. You know what? You're not wrong. Sal and I have done a lot of comic book shows, and I can whenever we do the booth thing, that's what it is. It's like okay, yeah. so this is the shy oh, yeah. guy. That's the what the guy that has passed my booth 15 times but hasn't said yeah. hi, just yeah. doesn't know how to say hi. That's that guy, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, or I recognize that, uh, you. <laughs> doesn't speak English so well, or someone who's really nervous, and when they come to talk to you, you sense that they're they're really slow at talking. So you immediately have to like slow down, lean in, and give them time, and like try to yeah. get them to say what they want to say because they want to say it but they're just nervous yeah um yeah they're all they're all types man but yeah that's that's so funny you can experience it's funny because them. i'll also do the video game conventions sometimes because we also do a lot of video game stuff um and we'll do the video game conventions and it's all the, it's the same thing you'll see all the people but different mm -hmm. types like because over there we'll have like the <laughs> hyperactive kid who wants to talk about minecraft and you know and then you've got the super duper shooter fan and like it, it, same thing yeah. you can put them all into brackets but yeah, totally. none of them are the comic people. <laughs> yeah, we have our own. There's probably like a good Venn diagram. There's a, there's a healthy crossover, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, we definitely have our own types here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, Sal, do you have anything else you want to ask? I feel no. Like we're uh, good, we've done a good what's, job. What's our target date for this, for this book? Ooh. Oh, uh, so we'll be wrapping up the Indiegogo in a few weeks. And um, I'll be shipping, we'll be digitally releasing the PDFs of the issues as soon as I'm done with them. So... I want to give people something to read while they're still under lockdown. Um, but as far as the physical units themselves, the books, uh, we hope to start mailing those out uh, first quarter of December. I'm sorry, nice. first quarter of uh, 2021. Sweet. That's that's a pretty yeah. quick turnaround, especially with yeah. everything going on. So I hope you <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I wish I could, like, there's only some, like, I really need to get back onto with with DC and I really want to get back on to working with some more Batman stuff. And, you know, I can't really talk about the plans that we have, but we have some stuff to un un unroll here and reveal. And uh, I'm really excited about that. 
I'm dying to get into doing another white night of some kind. So, you know, next time we hang out, hopefully I'll be able to talk about that. I will not say no. <laughs> as long as I, you keep doing your voices, man. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to use Joker again, but if you keep doing that Joker voice, I might have to throw them in there just to have the pleasure of you acting it out again. I do. That would be the most amazing thing ever. If I could even say, okay, so in passing, he may have mentioned that the Joker's there just so I can voice him. <laughs> yeah. But I can at least draw you into the background to entice you to, Give it a good review. So okay. we'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. But all right. Well, everybody go check out his Indiegogo. Uh, if, if it's anything even close to his prior work, even with just the art, I'm definitely going to recommend it. And we'll definitely be covering it here on the channel. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for already watching this. And thank you for being here, Sean. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate this. And thank you, Sal, for joining me for this particular thing. Happy and, to be here. Uh, <laughs> let's cut back to whatever show we put this into.